Okay, and up there. Okay, all right. There we go. Oh, hello. <laughs> yes, you can. I figure I'm far enough away from you that uh, it's it's good. It's okay for me to take this off. So, anyway, let me grab a quick drink of water. I missed you all. Um, and um, for those who couldn't make it in person, hello to everybody who's being recorded. So I hope everyone's been safe and well. Um, and uh, I'm really, really glad that this is the program that I get to talk about in person because um, this is another hour of seeing me geek out about images and, and stuff. So um, nothing wrong with that. So I'm, what I'm going to talk about is uh, a little bit of history of the James Webb Space Telescope and how we got to the point at which we are now. Um, some very recent images, including a couple that I, that I found today that I hadn't seen before. So uh, the science community is already publishing uh, research papers uh, on, on data from this telescope. And the initial set of data was released about two weeks ago. And it's just, this telescope is going to revolutionize astronomy, probably even in ways that we have no idea what ways they are. Because um, every time we look at images, we see stuff, we go, wait, what's that? Wait, what's that? So I'll explain more about that in just a little bit. But then um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the very initial science results. By no means is, is this the end of science results. We, we have a very long time with this telescope. Uh, so get ready for, for more. And, and even I could do this program next year and it would probably be completely different because we would have a new set of data and images by then. Um, and then the final thing is um, over the next year, they're gonna be starting the initial science campaign for this telescope. So what are some of the other uh, science investigations, what are some of the things they want to look at and, and what are they looking for? Um, but again, there's going to be, there are going to be so many opportunities to find things that we weren't looking for. And that's the really exciting thing about this telescope. It's going to show us things we've never seen. It's going to cause us to rethink things we thought we understood or we maybe didn't understand quite as well, but we may have to throw some stuff out the window. And that's the exciting thing about science and especially astronomy is, is if you think you're gonna, if, if all you find is what you expect, that's boring. <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more uh, when we get to the images part, but let me talk a little bit about history. So on April 25th, 1990, um, so a little over two, uh, 32 years ago, Hubble, pictured here, was deployed into low Earth orbit and it was launched the day before aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery. And this was the culmination of efforts that began in the 1960s to develop a large space-based telescope. Um, and indeed, the, the benefits of putting telescopes into space was noted as early, at least in science papers, and probably even well before then, uh, as early as 1946. There was a, a gentleman by the name of Lyman Spitzer who had written a paper basically saying, hey, if you put a telescope in space, it'll be above the blurring effects of Earth's atmosphere. It doesn't need to be incredibly huge um, to be really good. And so, uh, in this, this design effort began in the 60s and 70s. It was built in the 70s and 80s. Uh, it was ready to go in the mid 80s. The Challenger disaster happened, unfortunately, but it finally launched in 1990. And in the following 32 years, since that time, Hubble has cemented its place in history as one of the most influential and important telescopes ever. And I'm gonna make a prediction that the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be right up there with Hubble as far as influence. It may even, it may even surpass it for, for all we know. Um, Hubble has imaged the solar system. And this image of Jupiter is part of yearly maps of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune that Hubble does to keep an eye on 
cloud patterns, weather changes, uh, storm patterns, all that sort of stuff that we see in those planets, especially since we don't have spacecraft at Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Um, so using a telescope like Hubble can help us learn an awful lot, uh, especially when we don't have other spacecraft up close and studying it. Jupiter has the Juno spacecraft, and it's been there for a few years. Its mission is going to end in uh, 2025. So, uh, so it has something there, it just won't be there forever. Hubble has showed us the entire life cycle of stars, not the life cycle of a star from beginning to end. That's impossible, just takes way too long compared to a human lifetime. But the life cycle across many different types of star systems. This image was the first Hubble image to capture the public's fascination because it, it showed us something we had, uh, in a way we had never seen before. This is a, an object called the Eagle Nebula. Nebula just means fuzzy thing. And it, and it refers to when astronomers started seeing um, these objects through their telescopes a few hundred years ago and stars were pinpoints and nebulae were cloudy or fuzzy. And so anything that looked not like a pinpoint was called a nebula. So we have the word nebula attached to many different types of things. In this case, it refers to a region where stars form within these clouds of gas and dust. The gas is mostly hydrogen. Now Hubble went back to or, or photographed this object several times. Um, in 2014, this version was taken. And over time, Hubble was serviced. It was made even better. And you could, I mean, it, it's not even hard to make an argument. Hubble is better now than it was when it first launched and when it was first serviced and fixed. And this image right here has twice the resolution, several times the area, 20 times the pixels of the version I just showed you. But Hubble can do more. Hubble sees light that your eyes can see. It also sees a little bit of light that, that your eyes can't see. So a little bit of ultraviolet, the type of light that gives you a suntan, and a little bit of infrared. And you, you can detect, your skin can detect infrared as heat. So what can Hubble do with the infrared capabilities? Well, we can see into that dust, because I can tell you stars are forming within that dust and your immediate response is probably, I can't tell that, but you'll I'll have to take your word for it. Well, what do we see when we look into the dust? The dust is transparent when it comes to infrared light, it can pass through uh, the dust. And so this is what we see. It's the same image lined up and there are so many more stars that are visible, many of whom are within that cloud of, of gas and dust and shrouded. So these are very young stars still in the process of forming. And uh, we get a lot more information when we look not just using light that our eyes can see. So Hubble has seen things like this, the Orion Nebula, the fuzzy thing in the direction of the constellation Orion, by the way, it doesn't look like an eagle. If you've been trying to find an eagle in that, don't. It's, there's, it's not really referring to the shape. But anyway, um, the Orion Nebula doesn't look like Orion. It's in the direction of Orion. So that's where we get that name from. But uh, we've got stars that have formed within this cloud of gas and dust. And we, because we've got the ability to see very fine detailed information, we can look up close at many of the stars that are within this cloud. And you can see lots of them here, but when you look at them, you can go, well, well okay, I see stars, but they kind of have dusty stuff around them. And that's true. What you're seeing is stars that still have a cocoon of dust around them. They've just newly formed. There may be the possibility that planets could form in the dusty stuff around those stars. Um, It'll, it would take several million years for that to happen, but still, it's kind of neat. You're seeing essentially very young solar systems before planets have even started forming for the most part. Um, Hubble has been able to take pictures directly of a handful of planets. 
This is a planet right here. Again, you'll have to take my word for it. It looks like all the other dots in the picture, which are stars. Um, but Hubble has the ability in one of its instruments to block the light from something bright so you can see the dim stuff around it. And in this case, you can see dimmer dust that the star's light is lighting up, kind of like a searchlight lighting up fog. Um, but also, we've got a picture of a planet right here, and they've been able to measure that planet's um, movement around that star. So a handful of these planets can be imaged directly. Uh, the it, that's not the norm. Normally, planets are uh, the planets we've been able to find so far. The majority of them are really close to their stars, and so they'd be really hard to pick out in the glare of the star. Um, but if they're far enough away, we can get pictures of, of a few of those. This is an artist's rendition. This is not a real picture, but Hubble is fantastic for studying atmospheres, air around some of these planets. Um, in this case, we can learn about this one, which is WASP-12b. WASP refers to the, um, uh, the name of the telescope that studied the star. WASP-12 is the 12th star that WASP studied, and B refers to the first planet found around that star. So this is WASP-12b, the 12th star, the first planet around the 12th star that this telescope named WASP studied. Anyway, um, what do we know about this planet? Uh, it's one of the darkest known planets that we know of. It absorbs most of the light that hits it. If you want to see the color of this planet, the next time you see a freshly asphalted road, which I suspect you might start seeing on Roselle Road out here pretty soon. Um, wow, that's some construction you've got going on out there. Um, anyway, uh, next time you see a freshly asphalted road, check out the color, especially at night. Have you ever noticed how awful it is to drive on a freshly asphalted road, especially at night when it's raining? It's difficult, but you can get a sense of the color of this planet. This planet is also not a great place to go on vacation. Uh, the temperature of this planet is somewhere in the neighborhood of 4,600 degrees. So we can start to learn, are there planets? Can we get a few pictures of them? What are their temperatures? Do they have air? This is some of the information we can get uh, from a handful of these planets. We've seen the beginnings of stars. We've seen the endings of stars. This is called the Cat's Eye Nebula. It's one of the few things in astronomy that really does look like what it's named for. Um, this is the ending of a star that has puffed off its outer layers into space, not an explosion, just a gentle, gentle wafting of this stuff. Um, this thing in the middle is called a white dwarf. That is the center of the star. All this gas used to be attached to that. So that is what's left over after the rest of the gas leaves. And so uh, in astronomy, we name things and then figure out what they are. Um, so in this case, we call this type of object a planetary nebula. Where that comes from is there may not be any planets here. It has nothing to do with planets. It's that people saw these through their telescopes and went, oh, round like a planet. And the name stuck. And so we don't go back and change names. So this is called a planetary nebula. It just refers to how it looks through a telescope, not what it is. Um, but this is the ending of a star, very similar to how our sun will end in about three to five billion years or so. Our sun is gonna do something like that as well. Hubble has helped us in trying to figure out what the universe was like in the distant past. This is called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This image, uh, for this image, the telescope basically stared at the same spot in the sky for about two weeks worth of time. Not two weeks straight, but a little time here, a little time there. You put all the imagery together and you get this. What you're looking at, it looks like a bunch of stars and you're seeing a, a bare handful of individual stars. Those are stars within our own Milky Way galaxy. Think of them like spots on the window. You're standing at the kitchen window, you're looking out the window, and you may have some water spots on the window. 
Those are the stars that are within our galaxy. You have to look past them to the backyard to see what else is there and everything else, every other fuzzy thing that you see in this picture. So I'm gonna point out some individual stars. This is an individual star. This is one. Uh, it's hard to do from off to the side. There's one right here. I can tell because it looks like little rays coming off. Anything you see like the little rays coming off, that, that's a, those are individual stars. Um, everything else is another galaxy, another large group of stars, somewhere in the neighborhood of millions to billions to hundreds of billions to up to a trillion stars in each of, each of those fuzzy things. Every single dot fuzz that you see in this picture is another galaxy. There are about 10,000 galaxies in this picture. And what's also interesting is considering the size of the piece of sky that this is. Take a dime, hold it out at arm's length. President Roosevelt's eyeball at arm's length is the size of this picture right here. So really amazing stuff. That's just the barest of bare bones as to what Hubble has done in the last 32 years. Um, there's so much more. I've done talks for you about, about Hubble a couple times, um, but Hubble has limits. And the successor to Hubble is going to build upon its amazing work. Now, the development of the follow-on mission to Hubble started in the late 1980s before Hubble even got off the ground. Um, and it began in earnest in 1996. The launch of the next telescope was planned for 2007. Um, and a $500 million budget. <laughs> and the, in 2002, the telescope was named the James Webb Space Telescope after the NASA administrator who led the development of the Apollo program. Uh, the project had numerous delays, numerous cost overruns. Uh, when it underwent a major redesign in 2005, but what we got out of that redesign was actually a, a more capable telescope. We got some. We got to take advantage of the fact that technology had progressed long enough or far enough that there was something we were now able to plan to do with this telescope that we couldn't do before. And this is an early design. This is the current the artist rendition version of the of the telescope. By the way, one thing I am fully acknowledging um, that there is controversy with the naming of the James Webb Space Telescope after James Webb. He was involved in the Lavender Scare in the 1960s to, uh, to some degree still yet to be exactly figured out, uh, but they're working on it as to uh, uh, the potential that he or people who worked for him were involved in ousting uh, LGBTQ people in government, out of government at that point. So, and this happened at NASA as well. So there is some controversy as to the name of the telescope because of that. Um, I will say the name, um, but know that there are people looking into this and I don't know what the outcome of that discussion will be. What you mostly see now is people referring to it as the Web Space Telescope. Honestly, it's in addition to the, the problematic nature of the person who the telescope is named for, it's, it's a long name. <laughs> so you'll hear me say the Web Space Telescope um, just because it's a shorter number of words. And if I have to keep saying it over and over, that helps. Um, but anyway, I highly recommend you look into this and there will be more, NASA is looking into it some more. Um, I honestly don't know if they will keep the name James Webb Space Telescope. Um, that's, that's up for discussion at this point. But, you know, names matter. And how you honor people matters. So we'll see where this goes. Getting back to the delay in, in, uh, in the design of this telescope and what that did, um, this telescope was not originally designed to study planets around other stars. But because this redesign happened in 2005 and building of it started happening after that, we were able to incorporate new and better technology. So the, there are four key goals for this telescope. Um, search for the light from the first stars and galaxies that formed after the Big Bang. Study the evolution of galaxies over time. Study the life cycle of stars. <clears throat> study planets around other stars. 
That's essentially the, the four key areas that they're going to be using this telescope for. But the amazing thing is that there are probably going to be new things that will, that will be studied because of this telescope, because there's probably stuff we haven't even thought of. Um, and I'll get to the expected lifetime of this telescope in just a little bit. Uh, we have lots of participating countries. The building team was several thousand people from 14 different countries and ultimately tens of thousands of scientists and graduate students um, all over the world are gonna be using the data from this telescope and already have started. Uh, they released the first images on July 12th. Three days later, the first two science papers from this telescope were, were, were uploaded. Um, there was a, a couple of teams of people who were writing their papers really fast to try to be the first paper. Um, and the second team missed out by uh, on being the first team by 13 seconds. <laughs> so anyway, um, so another artist's rendition of this telescope. It's a big telescope. Um, the main mirror is uh, 21 feet across. It's composed of 18 different uh, segments, and those segments move individually. It's covered in gold. Um, a very thin layer of gold. It's very sturdy. It handles being uh, uh, cooled down to cold temperatures. Um, but you can see the size of the person compared to the size of Hubble's main mirror compared to the size of the James Webb Space Telescope mirror. Now, the expected resolution, the detail that we expected to get from the Webb telescope compared to Hubble was supposed to be similar. What we're seeing is it's even better, um, but we're, we're definitely seeing an improvement. The telescope is working better than designed, which is not surprising. NASA has this ability of, to do that. Um, you set the bar here, but you actually achieve <laughs> up here. <clears throat> but the, the difference in diameter for the telescope, if the resolution, the amount of detail that you expect to get from the two is similar, the way that happens is you Hubble primarily looks using light that your eyes can see, which, which is a shorter wavelength of light. Infrared light is a longer wavelength of light. So to get the same detail, you need a bigger telescope for the infrared, for the longer wavelength stuff. So that's why um, this telescope is big and also, because we could make it big. Um, now, it orbits out in space. It orbits the sun. We couldn't put this telescope on the ground. You'll see there's some artist renditions of telescopes that are on the ground. Um, what's shown in this graphic is which wavelengths of light can actually make it down to the Earth's surface. And if you see any of these color bars make it all the way to the surface, you can see that's that's a type of light that we can put telescopes on the ground and see that light coming through the Earth's atmosphere. Radio light, you can do that. Visible light, you can do that, but just about everything else is blocked by Earth's air. So in order to look at infrared light, primarily we have to put the telescope in space. The other problem is if we tried to put this telescope on the ground, some of the stuff we're looking for, especially around uh, on planets, around other stars, water vapor, oxygen, all, all that kind of stuff, we have that here. You'd be looking through Earth's data to find this teeny tiny bit of data from this far distant thing. And you would have to remove the Earth data, which is just incredibly difficult to do. So make it easier on yourself, put the telescope in space. Um, the other reason for orbiting it where it is, it orbits about a million miles farther out from the sun, from, uh, from Earth. And the reason for that is we need to get the telescope far enough away from the Earth so that this shield right here can block the light from the sun and the Earth. So there's no heat from either of those objects getting at the mirror. We need this to be super duper cold, extremely cold. Um, and so this shield right here shields the telescope from the heat. If we didn't do that, let's say we stuck this telescope in orbit around the Earth. Earth radiates heat that warms nearby satellites. 
it limits what Hubble can detect. Hubble is at a certain temperature. If you have certain wavelengths that you're looking at, you can't see them because the, the telescope is essentially detecting itself, the heat of itself. So if you cool the, temp the telescope down to a super cold temperature, uh, in this case, the, the main instruments are essentially exposed to space and the telescope is fully exposed to space. And so the temperature of the telescope is about, is just under 400 degrees below zero. There's another instrument on board that has an active cooler to get it down to a temperature of just about seven degrees above absolute zero. Seven degrees above, you can't get any colder than that. <laughs> so, um, so that's the reason for the odd design. Expose it to space so it can totally cool off. Have that heat shield to protect it from the sun and to block the light and, and, re and radiate that heat away so that you can get great data. So uh, just showing you the, the range of wavelengths in a graphic form. This is Hubble, this is Webb. So definitely seeing farther into the infrared uh, wavelength range. We've got four instruments um, on there. So there's the four main instruments that are gonna study stuff. And we also have on the back side of the telescope, you've got your solar panels. If you're wondering how this thing gets its energy, gets it from the sun, um, might as well. You've got that side always facing toward the sun. And uh, the, the uh, antenna is here to communicate with earth. Um, and so there you go. You've got light hitting this thing and uh, being able to be put onto four different detectors. Telescope launched on December 25th of last year. <clears throat> Great uh, Christmas present for the astronomical community. I mentioned it orbits a million miles away from Earth. It's not a million miles in orbit around the Earth. It's a million miles away from the Earth and it essentially orbits the sun. And so this is, uh, again, the, the closest it could be to Earth and still have that one solar shield block the Earth and the sun. And the way this thing orbits is, whoops, it, it orbits around a, a point, around that million mile away point. It's, it's an orbit that's fairly stable, but not totally stable. You always have stuff tugging on you. You got Jupiter pulling you this way, and you got Saturn pulling you this way. And so you're not gonna always stay at that million mile point. Eventually the telescope will drift away from that point. So it does have little rockets on it that will keep it in this, in this kind of rotating, um, uh, rotating around this point a million miles out. So this is what that orbit looks like. And so the, we, the reason I'm bringing this up is when the telescope was launched, it launched aboard a rocket from the European Space Agency. The rocket worked so exquisitely perfectly that it used very little extra fuel to get the telescope out to where it was gonna orbit. That means there's extra fuel on board to be able to keep it at that, at that uh, where it needs to be. Originally, the lifetime of the telescope was expected to be five years, with the outside chance that with enough fuel savings, they could get 10 years. The rocket worked so well, we're now hearing at least 20 years of lifetime with this telescope, if not more. So we're going to get our money's worth out of this one. Although we've had it up and running for only a few weeks, and it's already doing amazing things. Um, this is just showing you the difference in resolution between the previous best infrared telescope and Webb. So you don't even have to know what you're looking at to, to know, ooh, fuzzy, less fuzzy. <laughs> I can see more stuff in this picture. I can see more stars in this picture. The stars uh, look like pinpoints. You may also notice this interesting pattern right here. Those are called diffraction spikes. And those are due to um the light passing by different parts of the telescope so the the different shapes are due to the uh hang on let me go back the light passing by these struts right here and also the light uh, reflecting off the edges 
of the telescope here. So the, this edge right here. So that imprints essentially that diffraction pattern. So you can always tell what's a star. Well, almost always a star. You can almost always tell what's a star um, because stars are gonna be pinpoints and they're gonna be bright uh, a lot of times and they're gonna have those spiky shapes on there. Fuzzy stuff won't have those spiky shapes. All right, let's get to some pictures. And immediately I'm going to refute what I just said because that's Jupiter's moon Europa. Um, <laughs> so definitely not a star, but this is Jupiter. This picture was just taken a few weeks ago. Um, and this is an infrared view of Jupiter. What you're seeing is the shadow of one of Jupiter's moons right here. You've got Jupiter's moon Io right here. You've got the great red spot right here. You're seeing the heat of Jupiter. Um, astronomers know that Jupiter's upper atmosphere is hundreds of degrees hotter than the clouds farther down. And this telescope in a 75 second picture, this picture was taken in 75 seconds, just over a minute. Um, the red ring that you can see right here, that is the superheated or the, the hundreds of degrees hotter upper atmosphere and it just comes right out in the picture. Um, they knew it was there, um, but we've never seen it before on a global scale like this, especially with a picture taken so quickly. Um, also in this picture is Jupiter's rings right here. And also what is visible is we've got, uh, I mentioned uh, Eo right here. You can kind of see some brightness right down here. And actually, I'm really glad I'm seeing this on a big screen because on my laptop, I can't really see this as well. I can see this better. It kind of looks like a ring right down here. That's an aurora caused by material from Eo erupting off the surface from volcanoes and interacting with Jupiter's uh, magnetic field and, and hitting the atmosphere. So Eo is causing that, that aurora right there. That you that that glowing area that you see right down here, so it's it's pretty amazing that all this is visible in a picture again that took seventy five seconds to take. This is called the Southern Ring Nebula. This is like the Cat's Eye Nebula I showed you before. This is a Hubble picture. Um, so this is a star that puffed off its outer layers into space, and here's the core of the star left, and it's visible in the southern hemisphere. This is the Webb version. Um, so the, the star, it has been puffing off its layers into space, but it looks kind of oblong and you can see, um, different shapes in the, in the dust. There's actually two stars there. So a different instrument on web shows you the two stars that are in orbit around each other, causing those bubbles and strange shapes in the gas. And Again, you, uh, you've got, uh, this isn't lined up exactly with the Hubble one, but you can see it, it just pops right out. And the astronomers are like, oh my God, <laughs> you can see it just so easily. Um, and what's also really interesting is this. You see that little streak right there? You could see it, or you could see some aspect of it in prior pictures, but nobody knew what it was. Nobody could tell what it was until they realized with with Webb, it's a background galaxy. That is a, a galaxy in the background that um, it, it's perfectly edge on. It's probably like our Milky Way. If you could see it from the top down, it would probably be a spiral shape, but we're seeing it from the edge. And what's amazing is um, we weren't looking for that. that that's, that's astronomers looking at these brand new pictures going, what's that? <laughs> and study that and go, oh, that's a galaxy. Well, we're going to start studying this because when you look at these galaxies edge on like this, you can learn about their middles. So it helps to see this vantage point. These pictures that we're going to get from this telescope for the next 20, possibly 25 years, we're not only going to have to look at the stuff that, the, that they designed the the, the, the picture to be taken of, we're gonna have to look in the backgrounds of these pictures and go, what else is there that we never saw before? That's the exciting part. 
for scientists looking for how galaxies form and how they're structured, um, you need to learn about stars and how they form. This is a Hubble picture. This is a web picture of the same galaxy. And all that bright, all those brightly lit uh, columns or, or, or trails are places where stars are forming. So think Eagle Nebula, but way more, <laughs> lots more. And just stuff that could not be seen. You could see the dust in the Hubble picture, but you couldn't see the stars because they're within the dust. The dust blocks the visible light, but with web, pops right out. This is called the Carina Nebula. This is the Hubble picture and beautiful picture. What you're seeing is, um, the, the, well, what you can't see in this picture is there's some hot stars off the edge of the, the top of the picture here. They are, they are causing gas, this blue stuff right here to glow. So it's giving off what looks like uh, light and the dark stuff is dust and more than likely there's stars forming within the dust. Cool. Um, again, great Hubble picture. This is the web version. And the, the astronomers are looking at this picture going, what's that? We could see it before, but now we see the structure of it. And we've got to go, gosh, why does it look like that? Why is there this knot of stuff right there? Uh, what's causing that? And just, you can start to look at this picture and, and try to figure out what is going on there. So that's all the stuff that, uh, that initially pops out when they look at an object like this. This is a different instrument, its version of this. Everything that you see colored in red is dust that's surrounding a star. So what you're seeing, just to remind ourselves, you're seeing put into a visible, a way for us to visibly see light that our eyes normally can't see. So the different colors are referring to different wavelengths, different information, paint by number, essentially. Uh, they're taking different pieces of information and coloring it different colors. This is essentially what the Hubble palette looks like. You see very similar color palettes with the Hubble images. So in this particular case, all the information is real. This is a real picture. It would not necessarily look like this to our eyes if we were there. It is absolutely real. This is not an artist rendition or anything like that. It's just that they've colorized different wavelengths to make the information visible to us. So <clears throat> Hubble, or sorry, Webb tracked a planet around another star can't see the planet directly. It's very close to its star, well within the glare. So what they do is a different method of tracking these planets. Is, and as the planet passes in front of the star, it causes the star's light to dim. So if, if someone blocks a light, the light beyond is dimmed. Same thing with the star. The star's overall amount of light dims a little bit, and we can detect that. So here you've got the graph, and you see a very telltale graph as the as the planet comes around blocks the light from the star and then keeps on going and so this is called a transit and and we we've used this method to detect several thousand planets around other stars but what they have been able to do with Webb is not only say hey this planet has air it has water vapor in it and this planet has clouds and haze in the atmosphere this set of information and again i'm not going to go over the the details of this just just know that there are astronomers getting excited about squiggly lines on graphs and so the the various peaks of the squiggly lines tell us what's in the air of this planet and so this image the the set of data was taken over the course of about six hours um and we expect much more of that over the next uh especially the next year this is a Hubble image right here, and if this looks familiar, you have seen this group of galaxies before. This is the galaxies that are shown at the beginning, I think it's at the beginning, of It's a Wonderful Life, when they're talking to each other, right? So that's that. I have to, I have to confess, I've never seen the movie. I know, I know, I know, I know, I'll see it one of these days. 
um, especially now that I know there's galaxies in it. Yeah, so that's cool. Um, anyway, this is the, the Hubble picture, and this is called Stevens Quintet, and it is um, a Hubble and X-ray image, so visible light and X-ray image. Um, and so this group has been known about for a long time. So here's the Hubble image, nice, showing you stars and dust and stuff. Here's the web image showing you patterns in the dust and where stars are forming. And not only that, you can see that this looks kind of stretched out over here. These two galaxies are interacting with each other. So you've got one passing near the other and the gravity of one and yanking on the stars in the other. So you've got uh, material getting kind of stretched out a bit. And so it's, it's really kind of neat to see all that just crystal clear. Um, that these are stars within our own Milky Way. So these are the these are the dust spots on the window that you're looking past to see the galaxies beyond. And this is a different instrument on web to just show even more information. And what we see in this galaxy right here is there is a giant black hole at the center of that galaxy. We not only can know that there's a giant black hole in the center of that galaxy, we can see the material around the black hole in the center of that galaxy. We can we now have information about what the material is around that black hole, because that can tell you um, uh, about the the uh, mechanisms going on around that black hole. So I'm not going to go into the details of all that. Just suffice it to say. The fact that we can get this information, we could not get this information at such great distances before and, and such great detail before. This is a whole wide world of new stuff available to us. The composition of the gas, and again, squiggly lines on graphs, telling you the different peaks, telling you what the stuff is around, that, around those galaxies. The composition of the gas can tell us about the processes happening around and near the black hole. This is the Hubble image of this group of galaxies. Very pretty, right? Um, this is called SMAX 0723 Southern Massive Cluster Survey. So SMAX abbreviated. And 0723 is the number that they assigned to this group. Um, here is the web version. And what you can see is all these arcs and things. What's happening with this is we've got a group of galaxies and you can kind of see them here near the middle they they're closer to us then you've got material farther away and galaxies farther away what's happening is the gravity of the of the galaxies closer to us is causing the light from the more distant stuff to bend like a lens so gravity can warp space and warp so that we can see the stuff behind. Otherwise, if those galaxies weren't there, that other stuff might be too dim. It might be too dim in the, in the distant distance to be able to see it. So we've got uh, the nearby stuff, the gravity of it acting like a lens and warping the light from the more distant stuff. And the more distant stuff, the imagery that we see are those arcs that you see around various parts of the picture right there. <clears throat> This image was taken in 12 and a half hours. The Hubble version was taken in almost two weeks. So this telescope is going to revolutionize the time it takes to get this data. This is just remarkable. Um, the amazing other stuff we can get from this image is they, they wanted to image it. This is one of the pretty pictures they wanted to take first, but then you start to go, wow, what is in this picture? Well, first off, we can tell the distances to 46 of the galaxies that are in this picture. Some of them are some of the most distant galaxies we've ever seen. Um, one of these, and it's hard to see from over here on the side, it's this one. So this one, there's a smudge right there. Take my word for it. There's a smudge right there. And that galaxy is 13.1 billion light years away. That's, that's not a record. Um, I'll get to the record in just a second. Uh, but the fact that we can also get data about what these, about the distances of these things and get 46 pieces of information about this all at the same time. That's the revolutionary part. 
not just one galaxy at a time, 46 of them at the same time. So another thing, do you see those, those, those warps right there, those arcs? Somebody, uh, one, a colleague I worked with, looked at, the, looked at the picture just a few minutes after it came out and went, are those the same galaxy? And you know what? The scientists asked the same thing. They said, are, is that just two images of the same galaxy or are those two separate galaxies? And the answer is, it's two images of the same galaxy. <clears throat> because they can tell by the squiggly line on the graph that they are exactly the same. And so we have that information from from uh, this particular image. And you can see some of these warps all over the place. And it's just a close up of just a handful of the warps in here, but not to be outdone by a galaxy that's 13.1 billion light years away. This is a newfound galaxy in this picture. This is a very much a close up version of it. Um, this galaxy, if confirmed, it's not totally confirmed, the paper has been submitted, it's now up to the astronomy community to confirm that this information is true. This now may be the record holder galaxy for the most distant galaxy we've ever seen, that this galaxy is, you're seeing it as it existed 300 million years after the Big Bang. The, the previous record holder was 500 million years after the Big Bang. We've already lopped off 200 million years in distance farther distant. And that record is not expected to stand for long. There are absolutely going to be smudges in these pictures um, that are going to be even earlier objects. So it's just astonishing what we're getting from this. And that's just a glance. That's a 12 and a half our picture. There's going to be another version of, of this, one of these deep fields, stare at the sky uh, uh, images in November that's going to look for, I believe, I think it's 120 hours worth of time. I'm, I'm just speechless at what we might get from that. But for the first cycle of science proposals, they're going to also look at nearby stuff. Uh, we're going to look at Saturn's moon Titan. These are these are visible light images. These are Hubble um, and and uh, other spacecraft. Uh, Saturn's moon Titan, Jupiter's moon Europa, uh, planets and moons and asteroids and comets are great targets for infrared. Basically, anything uh, uh, cooler than a star is a great target for uh, for something like Webb. We're going to look at this planet right here, which is just an artist's rendition. We know it's a little bigger than Jupiter. Um, it has air, but we want to learn more about it. Um, this object is also very close to its home star, uh, a lot closer than Jupiter is. So we want to learn more about the processes that tell us about uh, what's going on there. We've got an artist's rendition for this one. This planet uh, might be a lava world. We have no analog in our solar system for a lava world. We, have, we do not have lava covered planets. Um, so we want to find out, is it actually lava covered? Does it keep the same side of the planet facing the star at all times? We will be able to figure that out. Um, does it have air? We will be able to figure that out. What's the atmosphere made of? We will be able to figure that out. So this is one of the first year targets. We already know that this artist's rendition, this planet does not have air, but we want to study the surface. What is the surface of this planet made of? What kind of rock is it? Not just, is there rock? What kind of rock is it? There's stuff about Venus we don't know to some of the degree that we may know some information in the next few years about, about some of these planets. It's already started looking at the planets in this system and uh, we wanna know, do these planets all have air? If so, what are they made of? What are the temperatures? of these planets. Is TRAPPIST-1c like Venus? We don't know. One of the things we don't know about Venus is how unique is Venus? Are there other Venuses elsewhere? We don't know. Has Venus always been the way it is now? We don't know. Um, so we want to see, can we find Venus analogs out there? So this is a great system to, to start to learn that. And yes, NASA is finally going to pay attention to Venus and send a couple spacecraft there in the next 10 years. So finally, Venus is getting some love, pun intended. 
Um, so we're going to combine images from different observatories, Hubble, Chandra, Webb. We'll all look at, for example, the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So we can study more about the black hole at the center of our Milky Way. And something that I, I kind of alluded to, some of the most distant galaxies we can't see using light that our eyes can see. We only can see them in infrared light. And Webb is already showing us that in two weeks, Webb is showing us that uh, we can already spot these things in a relatively short exposure picture. We'll have even more coming. Um, but this is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And again, that observation in November will be 120 hours worth of time staring at one spot in the sky. And it's going to be incredible to see what we get galaxies in various stages of evolution, stars in various stages of evolution. Um, and so it's going to be pretty exciting, to say the least. And the final thing is, if you want to learn more, um, you can go to www.jwst.nasa.gov. You can also just go to nasa.gov, and there is a tab at the near the top that talks about missions, and one of them is for the telescope. So it's it's very easy to, to get at this information. So. Um, questions. And what I'll probably do is, uh, oh wait, no, that's right. We're recording. We're not live. I'm so used to being on camera and having to repeat questions, but <laughs> anyway, sorry, go ahead. Uh, actually, no, I will have to repeat it because I want to make sure that the recording hears the question and the answer. Yes. Yes. So the question was, was there recent damage to the telescope? And there was. Um, it's been hit by little micrometeoroids about five or six times already. That was to be expected. It's fully exposed to space, so it absolutely will get hit by stuff. The thing that got a little bit of attention was the object that hit it in May. It was right around the end of May. And that was bigger than any of the material that they had been able to test for uh, on the ground or model for. And so that little micrometeoroid was about the size of a grain of sand. So it did result in a detectable change in the telescope's ability, um, but the telescope was already working better and still is working better than they originally planned. So even getting a slight degradation in what it can do, it's still better than what they expected so um but it absolutely will get hit by stuff over time especially over the course of 20 years um what's kind of neat is each of those uh, segments of the mirrors are individually movable and so every few days what they do is they refocus the telescope and if it ever happens that one of the mirrors is totally out of commission like something smacks it and just blows it away and it's just terrible well, they just remove that mirror from the data. And so, yes, you have a, a degradation in the amount of, of the data that you can get, but you still have a functioning telescope. So, um, so yeah, it, it's, it's going to continue to happen. It already even happened prior to when that one had hit. So, yeah. Yes? Didn't they say that the Hubble was going to stop working? Did they say that Hubble was going to stop working? Yes. Um, Hubble has lasted for over 32 years. It could stop working tomorrow. Um, we don't know how much longer it's going to last. Hopefully another few years, maybe. Um, it could have a stray cosmic ray fry it. It could have a piece of space junk hit it. Um, it could have uh, the ability to stop pointing in the right direction, the, the, the gyroscopes essentially that keep it pointed could stop working at some point. Um, so we don't know how much longer we'll get uh, with Hubble, but the fact that both Hubble and Webb are operating at the same time is rather amazing, especially since the original launch date of this telescope was 2007. And I remember every time I gave my Hubble talk, ever since about 2005, had been referring to a potential launch date that kept getting farther into the into the future. <laughs> so it, it's it's kind of great that Hubble lasted this long um, to be able to hopefully use them at the same time. 
Yes. The astronomer has been looking at what they thought might be planets to be closer to the stars to us that could support life, the right size, the right distance from the star. Are they going to be able to look at that? with the web at all and get more information. Are they gonna be able to look at web and try to get information about the potential for life on planets around other stars? Yes, that is one of the goals is, um, I, I, I glossed over it before, but as part of looking at planets around other stars, they're going to look for what we think could be telltale signs of what life might look like, meaning, what is the evidence in our air that life is here? Water vapor, oxygen, hydrocarbons, burned hydrocarbons, um, some kind of telltale signature that something that you might not normally find if there wasn't life there. Um, so it'll be an interesting thing to see what we get, but a lot of the initial planets are very close to their stars. Um, but some of these cooler ones, some of the cooler stars, the planets maybe a little farther out, they may have temperatures that where the, the temperature could allow liquid water to exist on the surface. What if we finally find evidence of a planet around another star with liquid water on the surface? That'll be exciting just by itself. Um, but my long-winded answer to your question is yes, they want to start to try to help answer the question, could there possibly be life elsewhere in the universe? And we're not necessarily talking about intelligent life. It could just plant life, bacteria life, something that alters its planet in some way that we may be able to detect. But we don't know what we don't know what we're going to find, which is kind of exciting. So yes. At the end of Hubble's life, is it going to have to come back down? At the end of Hubble's life, is it going to have to come back down? The answer is probably. Um, what they would normally have to do is just let its orbit decay and let it uh, fall into the Earth's atmosphere and burn up. The problem is more than likely a good chunk of it would survive all the way to the ground. So what you want to do is a controlled reentry but it doesn't have any rockets on it. So it's kind of hard to do that. NASA has been testing um, remotely attached rockets to potentially either bring it in a controlled way into the Earth's atmosphere so that it doesn't hit anything important or boost it to a higher orbit, um, which means it's out of danger. So, but for right now, its orbit is fine. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a few things to consider about how to end Hubble's existence, essentially, either boost it to a higher orbit and just let it sit there or control it into the Earth's atmosphere, which we kind of don't totally have the ability to do right this very second. So, um, but it's going to be a while before that might be a problem. So we've got, got a little bit of time, but NASA has been testing uh, different options for that. So, yes. How far in advance have they prioritized what Webb will look at? They've got the first year of observations and the call for what they're calling cycle two is, um, I think it's out right now or maybe it just happened. Anyway, um, so they, they do it about a, a year's worth at a time. And the amazing thing about how they did it and they're gonna continue to do this and I hope other telescopes take note, and I think they are. The way they did it was really interesting. They took all the identifying information out of the proposals so that people reviewing them didn't know who the proposers were. They also didn't tell the proposers who the reviewer team was going to be. So completely double blind. And what you got out of it so it wasn't that like you're going to get trash proposals. You still had to have good science in your proposal. It's just wasn't going to be obvious who it was who was proposing. So you get away from that unconscious bias that you might normally get like, oh, well, that team, oh, I know them. Oh, yeah, of course, they're going to do good work. Sure, we'll give them time on the telescope. That's not going to happen. So um, what they got was more women as principal investigators. And they got graduate students who were approved for time on the Webb telescope. 
So you got a much more diverse group of people who were approved for time. And the only way that could happen was remove those sources of bias. And it wasn't even that people were consciously going, no, I don't want to give that to this group because I know them and no, they won't do good. It wasn't that. It was, there's some times where you go, oh, they're, they're at Harvard. Of course, they're going to be great. Well, take away some of that extraneous stuff. And, and it also was shown when they took a look at, um, I think it was Hubble, Hubble proposals, uh, women were very, usually systematically very much uh, not represented in their proportion to the, to the community. Um, but this time around, much higher percentage. So it really cool. That, that they did that and they're going to continue to do that, which is neat. So yeah, about a year at a time. And so, oh, you have a follow up. <laughs> yes. Uh, have they left any time for, uh, where they say, wow, what is this? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, yep. So yeah. Yeah. So the question was, do they have any time for weird stuff? like something you weren't expecting? And the answer is absolutely. There is um, director's discretionary time. So the director of the Space Science Institute at Johns Hopkins, which runs Webb and Hubble, um, that person has discretionary time. They've also got uh, the ability to go, oh wait, something weird, look at it. And they've already proven that they've, they've already done that. I think there was a supernova that was identified and they happened to get it in a picture. And so, um, yes, the, the short answer is yes, they do have some ability to do that. And if, if it's just something that you go, wow, the first supernova visible in the Milky Way galaxy for the, for the last 400 years, oh, you better believe everything else is going to get pushed to the side and we're going to, they're going to study that. So yeah, that'll definitely happen. So, yes. I wasn't here at the beginning of time. Is the time proportioned by different countries? Oh, uh, ah, so is the time on the telescope proportioned by different countries? Are there quotas? I did not talk about that. So thank you for asking that question. Because the European Space Agency provided the rocket, there is time set aside specifically for European Space Agency scientists or European scientists. So yes, there is for the countries that participated directly, rocket, science instruments, that sort of thing, um, you get proportional time on, on the telescope as well. So they'll have for the general science community, but also specifically for those countries who, who got a little skin in the game, as it were, um, to be able to get time on the telescope. So yeah, that, that definitely happens, yes. All right, any other questions before we end for tonight? Cool. Thanks for coming, everyone. We'll see what the future holds for this telescope and whatever its name is. And um, uh, hopefully I'll have even more pretty pictures to show you uh, when I come back. Thank you very much. <laughs>